Welcome to the Bible study. And if this is your first time, and it probably is, please know that there's a full transcript down below that you can read for yourself. And it has all the Bible verses used for reference. And uh, also hit that like and subscribe button. That helps get it out to other folks. Please let us uh, leave a comment. Let us know where you're listening from. And uh, with that, let's get into Malachi 2.10, Faithfulness. Malachi 2.10, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Having finished rebuking and warning to the priests, God now turns his attention to the people. The people also disrespected his covenant and the law. Verses 10 through 17 has a lot to say about the people's abuses, including divorce, injustice, withholding ties, and speaking against the Lord. In a brief historical note, there are a lot of similarities of issues in Nehemiah and Malachi, but from a different perspective. Historically, we know that Nehemiah went to Jerusalem in 445 BC with permission from King Artaxias to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He became the governor of the region for 12 years. During his stay, he refused to take any of the allocations due him as governor as he didn't want to be a burden to the people. During his term, he enacted many important changes such as appointing leaders and restoring lands to the poor as they had been taken away by exorbitant taxes. He also resettled a tenth of the population into Jerusalem and the rest of the into the towns and lands across Judea. In 433 BC, Nehemiah returned to Artaxias Sometime after that, but before the king's death in 424 BC, Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem and assumed his role as governor. You can read about his return in Nehemiah 13. Many abuses had built up across the land during his absence. We read that he drove out Tobiah from a room in the temple that he was occupying for personal use. He reinstated the practice of tithing to support the Levites. He enforced observance of the Sabbath. He prohibited marriages with foreigners, which were leading the Jews into idolatry. He expelled the son-in-law of Sanballat from the priesthood. All of these are similar practices Malachi prophesied against. That is why many believe that Malachi was written during Nehemiah's absence probably close to his return. And once again, I direct you down to the transcript down below. You can see all the Bible uh, Bible verses written out uh, that reference everything I just said here. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Notice the shift in the wording of this verse. It has moved from you and they and changed to we. This is Malachi's voice rather than God's. He is now addressing the people of Israel and including himself. That doesn't mean that he necessarily participated in the sinful actions, but it does emphasize that the entire nation will be held guilty for all of the abuses. This section uh, 10 through 16 begins with the same general pattern as in Malachi 1.6, a general statement which everyone can agree. In Malachi 1.6, he says, A son honors his father, and a slave his master. Here he says, Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Nothing controversial about either statement until God hits them hard with what they have been doing. Everyone agrees that Yahweh is Israel's father. Although the image of God as a father is rather rare in the Old Testament, in Exodus 4.22, God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Other verses where God is called Israel's father include Deuteronomy 32.6 and Isaiah 63.15. The point of this figure of speech is that Yahweh cares for his people. In fact, the Jews owe everything for their existence to God. Of course, 
Everyone can also agree that God created us. Just read Genesis chapter 1. Why then are we faithless to one another? After agreeing that God was their father and creator, Malachi asks a very probing and condemning question. Why are we faithless to one another? It's interesting to note Malachi is not asking about how the people treat God, rather how they treat each other. They were being faithless or bagged to one another. In Hebrew, it means treacherous and deceitful. It's an intentional pre-planned action. You can't just fall in the bagged. This word is used four more times in this section and is very serious as we will see. The opposite of bagged is faithful or imuna, which means faithful or to be completely trusted. An interesting note, the root word of imuna is amen. The word amen comes out of the Hebrew root word for faith. Amen meaning to believe, to confirm, or to support. So saying amen is saying, I believe it. Scripture tells us numerous times that one of God's primary attributes is his faithfulness. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations from Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. Here's a perfect verse to memorize. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. From Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. Profaning the covenant of our fathers. This is the second part of the question Malachi is asking. Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? It is how they are being faithless to one another. We have seen the word profane before in verse 112, where the priests are accused of profaning the name of Yahweh. It means to defile, pollute, or even break. The people were defiling the covenant of their fathers. Throughout the history of Israel, there were a number of covenants made between God and his people. The one that Malachi is referring to is called the Mosaic Covenant, which was given to Moses. It was a covenant between God and the nation of Israel given at Mount Sinai. You can read about it in Exodus 19 through 24. The Mosaic Covenant begins with the Ten Commandments and continues with the law that was meant to govern and shape the people of Israel in the Promised Land. This law was not a means of salvation, but would distinguish the people from the surrounding nations as a special kingdom of priests. This covenant was conditional and defined blessings and curses based on their obedience or disobedience. See Deuteronomy 28 through 29. Obviously, profaning the covenant is not a good thing. In the rest of chapter 2, we'll see what the Israelites were doing to make God angry. In Habakkuk, we saw the nation of Judah devastated by God because of their disobedience. In Malachi, we are studying how God is rebuking and punishing the priests for dishonoring the name of God. And we are beginning to study the passages where God has many things against the people as well. In fact, much of the Old Testament contains of God's judgment on Israel for being faithless. Many often think, well, that was then and this is now, as if the New Testament God has somehow changed from the old. To them, he seems a little bit nicer. Judgment and punishment of God's people has changed to grace, tolerance, and forgiveness. But that is a faulty and flawed understanding. Scripture tells us that God does not change. The theological term for this is immutable. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. In fact, we will read later in Malachi, for I am the Lord, I do not change. That's in Malachi 3, 6. 
In the New Testament, we also see the unchanging nature of God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Therefore, scripture is clear. God is immutable and he does not change. While the church is not a replacement for Israel, we are also God's children. And God still punishes and disciplines his children for unfaithfulness and sin. Just ask Ananias and Sapphira from Acts chapter 4. Again, in Hebrews 12, we read, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So yes, God is the same. He still disciplines his children. If you find that you're having to repeatedly learn from God the hard way, then pray and ask the Lord to help you learn quickly what he is trying to teach you. That's our study for this session. Uh, once again, please hit that like and subscribe button. Uh, go ahead and read the full transcript down below. And uh, we will see you on the next one.